Got it. Okay, great. And as usual, I will start with uh, working group updates for the first half of the call, and then um, we'll turn it over to you, Ashok, for your presentation. Absolutely. So, welcome everyone to the Identity Implementers Working Group Call for November 17th, 2022. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Shar Howland, and I'm a co-moderator of this group with Tim Spring. Uh, let's see. As usual, since this is a Linux Foundation call, we're following the antitrust policy. And as a Hyperledger call, we are following the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. And both are linked here if you'd like more information. Uh, this call is being recorded and will be posted on uh, this meeting page later today. I will send the link to this page. And if anybody wants to put their name under attendees, uh, that would be great. Um, would anybody like to, to introduce themselves if you're new to the working group? Um, Ashok, feel free to introduce yourself now or before the presentation, whichever you prefer. I'll do it later, no problem. Sounds good. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, just a couple of announcements. There's an Indicio meetup later this month uh, on Tuesday, November 29th. The topic is on how to use Akapai to issue and verify J JSON LD credentials. Um, the, present the presenters are Daniel Bloom and Peter Strobel, and the registration link is here. Um, let's see. And then we won't have this call on December 29th uh, for the for the holidays. Are there any other announcements that anybody would like to say before we start in with the working group updates? All right. So moving on to working group updates. Main identity working group, uh, we've reported on them in the past. Um, the Hyperledger Indie Contributors Working Group. I will be able to give more detailed updates on this group because I'm going to start co-chairing this group. Uh, so the main two initiatives we're focusing on are getting the Ubuntu 20.04 upgrade completed. This has been a bit of a harrowing process, but hoping to accelerate that to the finish line. The other is eliminating the Indie SDK. Um, so those are the two main overarching goals in the group as well. We're also working on creating a roadmap for the project. So we'll have some discussions about that. And if you if you would like to give input on that, you are very welcome to, to join the calls. Um, let's see, the sovereign node build item is about the pipeline for sovereign node. This is a, the test automation to make that process easier. Um, getting Indie Node past the RC status. There's been development on two different branches of Indie Node and Plenum, so getting that all sorted out. So that's mainly what we've been working on in that group. Let's see, Aries working group, anybody I attend? Yeah, go for it, Lynn. Sorry, Shar, I just wanted to, uh, to come in and make sure uh, there's been a, a misinterpretation of a of an issue that I presented a little while ago. And so I wanted to make it public, uh, the results of my findings. There was a, um, a comment in one of our uh, Confluence reports from not this last one, but the one before, that there might be a, a security issue. And I had raised that issue that I was gonna look into it. And some people had unfortunately taken that issue and thought that it was a real issue. and I did a bunch of testing and stuff. This is related to the uh, VDR issue with Genesis file node mismatch issue. It's mentioned on the thing here, but I thought I'd give a few more details. Um, there are some uh, problems discovered where if too many nodes from a Genesis file um, go out of, uh, are not available anymore based on their information that's in the Genesis file, that there's some troubles with Indie VDR. And so we, as I researched that, I, I thought there might be a security hole. I did a bunch of tests and tried to, to prove that there was a security hole and there is not. The current Indie uh, node 
implementation through Indie VDR and through Indie SDK do not have the security issue that I thought might be there. I thought you might be able to take over a network, for example, by just having one node from a Genesis file, and that is not the case. And I just wanted to report that here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for reporting that. Lynn, that sounds like very good news. So I appreciate you jumping in with that. All right, Aries Working Group. Did anybody attend this one who'd like to report? So they've been talking about uh, push notifications. They merged in a PR with updates to the push notifications um, RFC. And then there are a few documentation related PRs for push notifications that um, need to be merged in. Also merged in some error reporting PRs. And then they've also been talking about the um, replacing Indie SDK, uh, like we just talked about in the Indie contributors call. And then also planning out IAW topics, which a lot of the groups have been doing. Let's see, another thing, uh, one thing relevant to Aries, we had a Hyperledger Aries workshop um, this past Thursday, um, hosted by the NDCO team. And um, there were attendees from over 20 countries and lots of great questions. So that was a, a success and a great thing for the project. Let's see, anybody attend the Aries Bifold user group? Looks like they've been um, working on OCA and some uh, bugs in particular uh, mediation, mediator connection bug, and then state management. Let's see. Just a question for the recording. Um, I'm really interested in how the Bifold user group is dealing with or relating to the open wallet project that the Linux Foundation announced. So for anyone who hears this recording and is involved in Bifold, it would be really good to hear an update about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking that question. All right, in the um, Acapug call, uh, this past week, we there was an interesting discussion on queues and caches, Redis and Kafka mediators and agents. Um, so that was the majority of the meeting. And then um, version 100 RC1 has been released in all the normal places. So also good news. Anybody attend Aries Framework Go? Not too much info on their page. It looks like they've mainly been um, going over work updates. Let's see, anybody attend the um, AFJ meeting? Uh, to the first point on credential delay uh, with what they're working on there, it sounds like a first credential exchange has a significant delay from um, accepting the offer to receiving the credential, where it doesn't return the did when it has found it on the ledger, but it just continues to try to resolve it from all ledgers. And so then the more ledgers are added, the larger the delay. And they discovered that qualified dids um, can provide a, a solution to this because they don't need to fetch them from all the ledgers. And then they've also been talking about didcom v2 support and the 030 release, and then Again, the, the Indie SDK migration that we have already discussed. And then Hyperledger Ursa, anybody want to report on this one? So I, I posted the link to the um, their Q3 report. Um, it looks like the, the project health, they described it as shaky, but they have reasons to be hopeful. Um, there are, have been no new maintainers or contributors added lately. Um, but on a more positive note, um, the code review and assessment of Ursa was completed this past quarter by ID Lab and only minor issues were discovered. And then they also predict that with the new Hyperledger non-creds project, um, this will increase focus and hopefully activity in Ursa. All right, any other Hyperledger related updates? Uh, 
All right, moving on to the Trust Over IP Foundation. Let's see, it looks like we talked about the all members meeting last time um, in the, the last steering committee meeting. They had a um, they had a, a vast um, proposed that the steering committee uh, would make it expl uh, an explicit strategic objective of the foundation to establish an interoperability certification framework um, within two years of publishing the V1 TOIP technology architecture specification. So that was mainly what they talked about. Anybody involved in the communications committee? Looks like they've been going over blog updates and approvals, website update, uh, defining digital trust ecosystems. How about the governance stack meeting? Anybody involved in that one? Looks like they got an update on the governance architecture task force and discussed the uh, proposed TIP interoperability certification framework. Let's see, looks like we reported on the technology stack working group last time. Uh, let's see, utility foundry. Um, Lynn, were there any updates there? There are no updates there. The uh, Utility Foundry Working Group members have all kind of uh, en masse moved over to helping with the governance architecture task force. Some of the things we were doing kind of matched with that. And so we, all of our current efforts are working on that task force. And so our uh, committee meetings and, um, uh, sorry, our work group meetings are uh, currently on hold until uh, that task force is complete and and then we'll move on with uh, more stuff later so we're we're kind of on hiatus i guess might be the right word for it okay for a while. great thanks for that update all right and then for the ecosystem foundry group uh looks like they've been also talking about the governance architecture, um, the methodology and TOIP ecosystem components, concepts and terminology. Uh, let's see, looks like they've been planning IAW sessions and talking about a holder binding paper. Any other TYP updates? All right, moving on to the DIF for the DIDCOM working group. So just to reiterate the new plan for these meetings, the first Monday of the month is the uh, DIDCOM working group. The next three Mondays are the user group. And then there's a break if there's a fifth Monday in a month. Um, that is the new plan for the future. It was intentionally out of order the past few weeks. So we reported on the last working group meeting that was on October 31st out of order. And then the next Monday um, was an out of order working group meeting. And then this past Monday was canceled for IAW. So we have already reported on them. Uh, the DITCOM users group, anybody attend this one? I was only able to attend uh, just a, a little bit of it. And I wasn't able to track down the meeting notes. Looks like the interoperability group was canceled for IAW. And let's see, for these last few, is anybody aware of any um, sovereign related updates or W3C related updates? All right, well, unless anybody has any more uh, working group related updates, I think we can turn the call over to Ashok for your uh, presentation. Fantastic. That's a very exhaustive update that you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. 
So hi everyone, good to meet, meet you all. My name is Ashok Kuranatibe. I'm Director of Professional Services for Casper Labs. Um, and I'll talk about Casper Labs a little bit. Um, but about me, uh, I've been with Casper Labs for about three and a half years now. Um, joined pretty early when the company was founded. Uh, I think I was, uh, uh, when I joined the company, was still in single digits. We are close to 83 now. Uh, prior to Casper Labs, I was with Google. I spent 12 years with Google across different parts of Google and, and different uh, regions as well. I started in India, in Hyderabad for about four and a half years, then moved to Singapore for three years and then Mountain View uh, before I uh, left Google to join Casper Labs. And prior to Google, uh, in my previous life, I was with the Indian Navy. I did a full commission with Navy, retired as a commander. And by education, I have uh, undergrad in mechanical engineering, uh, uh, graduation um, master's degree in nuclear engineering from IIT Kanpur, uh, MBA from XLRI, and executive MBA from Stanford. So that's my uh, short introduction. Um, Casper Labs um, is a layer one blockchain, a proof of stake blockchain that is. Uh, designed and implemented with enterprise use cases in mind. So from the very inception, uh, the founders, Renal and Meda, have been focused on making it uh, suitable and trying to solve uh, problems that enterprise adoption has been facing in, in particularly public blockchain networks, right? And the presentation that I have today uh, is a step towards uh, making that um, uh, you know, getting more enterprises onto 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 a public network and solving some of the problems that uh, that enterprises have been facing. So let me quickly switch over my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, all right, just one second. Okay, so um, so what, what I'm demonstrating today is um, interoperability between Hyperledger Fabric and Casper uh, blockchains. Uh, the setup here is essentially um, that you have a private network on which uh, assets are uh, uh, Assets. There are assets which are stored on the uh, permission private network run on Hyperledger Fabric, and Casper Network, which is a public network, um, has um, the currency that can be used to uh, used to acquire or uh, transfer these assets. Uh, both parties here, Alice and Bob, have accounts on both the networks. That's important uh, to understand this. And this is essentially the, the flow where Alice uh, creates an agreement uh, and locks it with uh, a certain secret phrase. And then um, Bob uh, looks at this available asset, uh, which is owned by Alice and wants to buy it uh, from her. And he sends out a proposal. There is a transaction of tokens happening on the um, on the Casper network, which uh, is then reflected in Alice's account, and Alice's Alice uh, then uh, enables the transfer of the of the asset to Bob. Uh, the assets are locked uh, for for a certain time um, in a contract. In any of the state where uh, anything fails, the the asset uh, the the whole situation will go back to. Uh, the original state, right? If if uh, Bob is not able to acquire the asset, the, the tokens will be restored to Bob and uh, will not come into Alice's account. And if Alice is not able to transfer, again, the same situation uh, will be established. So, um, so this is uh, the bond network. Uh, this shows the CBDC or network on Casper. The, the bond network is using uh, um, Hyperledger Fabric. And this is essentially the steps that uh, that we are going to follow here. 
So there are basically three actors here. One is the treasurer. Um, treasurer is the person who creates a bond on the bond network. You can say administrator. And Alice and Bob are the two parties transferring or exchanging uh, the asset. They have accounts, as I mentioned earlier, on both, both the networks, right? So let's let's go through the steps one by one. I log in here as a treasurer. I can see available bonds here. I can also see issue bonds that have been issued with, with the current owners. Let's create a, a new bond. Uh, one, say face value of thousand. You can assume some interest rate, gold, really create a new bond. Now you can see the available bonds has increased. This is the bond that we have just created, right? Uh, we can note down this bond ID for, for our record. And I can use the same at the end of this for keeping this record of things that we are doing here. All right, so this bond is created. I now log out. I log in as Alice. And I see here uh, the number of bonds that are actually acquired by me as an Alice. Um, the total bonds that are available and owned by different, uh, different persons. And here is the bonds that are available for my, uh, my purchase. And this is the bond that we are looking at right now. This was created today uh, in the earlier step. And I, as an Alice, initiate a purchase and I purchase this. And this is the primary market, right? So uh, the purchase has been successful. Now I see this bond under my, my bond. So this is now held by me. Please stop me if, if uh, you want me to kind of repeat or um, explain any other steps. Now I log in uh, the bond network uh, as a pop. And I, again here, I see the bonds that are owned by me, the bonds that are listed, and that the bonds that are acquired by different people. Now I see this particular bond. This is the same bond that uh, Treasurer created and at least acquired from the primary market. And I'm interested in purchasing this bond. So I initiate purchase and I request this. Let me exit from Bob. Alice on her will get a notification here that you can see on the top right corner. Uh, she sees the notification that there is a request uh, from Bob to acquire this particular bond and she can either reject or approve it. If she has to approve it, she'll kind of create a secret code. Um, let's go with this code at this point in time and she can approve. What's the purpose of typing in the secret there? I don't understand that part. So, I mean, in this particular case, um, we are demonstrating uh, the, the secret code is um, so that nobody else other than Bob actually, uh, you know, um, acquires the asset. So, so there has to be a code with which the, cost, the smart contract locks in the bond, right? So Alice is going to share that with with Bob at some point. Is that uh, so? No, uh, she actually doesn't share the code. That uh, uh, there is a Weaver um, engine operating uh, behind the scene, which actually shares the hash with uh, with the smart contract. Uh, so this this bond is now locked locked with a hash. Okay. 
So this is hash time lock contract. So let's note down this hash here for records. Right. And come back to the next step, which is uh, so this is where we are right now. The secret code is uh, created and um, the, the bond is locked in now with that particular code. Now let's move over to the, the CBDC network and log in as Bob here. Well, I'm sorry, this is too slow today for some reason. So Bob currently has uh, around 12,000 tokens, uh, but he needs to transfer these tokens to Alice's account uh, so that he can then uh, claim the bond, right? And you see the request has been uh, received by the, by, uh, um, by the CBDC network Bob account. And you see this hash is same as the hash that we saw here. this one. So now Bob knows that his request um, it has been approved by Alice. And she has initiated the transfer of the account, uh, some transfer of uh, tokens. So 1000 tokens will be taken out from Bob's account and eventually will be transferred to Alice. So he approves this. And now you have a deploy hash because this is a public network. Um, a deploy will be made to the public network. Let's record this as well. So this is a deploy hash where tokens are being transferred from Bob to Alice, but they don't go directly. They are locked into a smart contract. And uh, Alice has to later go and claim it. We can observe, let's log out of this and let's observe the chain. This is a block explorer uh, for Casper Labs chain. Okay, uh, we'll have to wait uh, for the deploy to go through okay so this deploy has gone through you can see the success uh, criteria here uh, this is the deploy hash that we have seen here 4432319c4 and if you want you can you know see the details of the of of the transfer here in the in the raw uh, data that is available with that transfer. So essentially this, these tokens are now locked in. You can see this is a deploy, which is successful screen. Um, we can now go to the CBDC network, log in as Alice. Sorry, before that we had to come here. Uh, login as Alice. Sorry. Okay, so Alice has now uh, come to her account and she wants to claim the tokens. She puts the same secret key that she had put in the bond, bond network when she uh, locked the bond transfer to, uh, to Bob. So she claims the amount. This is again 
a deploy that goes onto the network. Let's note it down. Then we go to the Explorer and see and observe the transfer. Takes about a minute for it to go through. Okay, this is still in pending state. The concept here is of the hashed time locked uh, contracts. That's what has been implemented. So you have um, a smart contract running on Casper blockchain and um, and Weaver is managing the, the transfer of the keys behind the scene here. So now we see that this is successful. And in this particular deploy, the secret key is also revealed. So this is the secret key that you see here, which Ali said typed in. Um, but even though you can observe this, a third party cannot make use of this anymore because even if they know the secret key now, the, the actual transfer is locked in to only Bob. So only Bob and Bob can claim it and nobody else um, on the bond network. So if somebody else tries to log in and um, claim the bond, they won't be able to. So let's log in here again as Bob. Now that we know that the transfer of token has happened, uh, we can now claim the bond. And I now know uh, as Bob the, the secret key because I've observed it on, on the chain and then I claim the bond. So bond has been successfully claimed. We can see the same bond here. Uh, this is created today. Same bond that we have been uh, the, the treasure initially created and uh, Ellis later owned. So this actually demonstrates how uh, using uh, hash time lock contracts, we can transfer safely um, between um, the assets on a uh, permission network uh, by transferring the tokens on uh, a public network. So that completes the demonstration part. I am open to questions. Thanks for the, the demo. It's a really clean interface. Um, could, do you think you could go back to the diagram that shows the steps between mm -hmm. Alice and Bob? Just yep. now that we've seen it in action, do you think yep. you could talk just briefly through those steps? Yes, certainly. So we have, we have not talked about the, the, the treasurer creating the bond because that's kind of given. So um, Alice, uh, Alice agrees to Bob's proposal and essentially locks the asset with, with the hash. And this is locked for a period of 2T, for example. Um, then Bob creates corresponding agreement and um, so, so this, the transfer of tokens on the, on the public network is, is happening here. And when Bob transfers Ali, uh, tokens to Alice's account, that information is captured by the smart contract. And then the the transfer is enabled. So essentially, that's what we are doing here. So Bob transfers the tokens, Alice takes the tokens, and then automatically the bond is released from Alice to uh, Bob. In the intermediate space, the, the smart contract locks both the bonds and the tokens. So if anywhere this had to fail, 
uh, it will go back to the original state. The tokens will be restored to Bob's account and the bond will be restored to Alice's account. Okay, that's really helpful. Thanks for, for going back over that. I don't know too much about Hyperledger Fabric. Can you talk about why you chose that ledger to, to develop this interoperability with the Casper blockchain? Yeah, so um, essentially the, the you know, um, Hyperledger Fabric has been extensively used by uh, many organizations uh, for, for um for maintaining a, a ledger of their assets. Now, there are several reasons. One is uh, definitely um, early on, right? Uh, the public permissionless networks uh, were not considered very reliable. Secondly, many organizations don't want uh, their data to be on the public chain, so they wanted to keep it in a permission network. So as a result of that, as a result of you know just the legacy, a lot of uh, organizations already have uh, assets on the Hyperledger Fabric network, and it's also considered as enterprise grade permission network, right? So that's the reason um, we created this. We also worked with uh, IBM very closely on this. Uh, in fact, this was presented by. Um, uh, first time in a World Economic Forum Davos uh, in, in in May 2022 by me and uh, Bhargav was uh, as a principal uh, you know uh, scientist at uh, IBM and then Hyperledger Fabric Conference in Dublin in September uh, me and uh, Sham present Sham from IBM presented it uh, second time with some improvements to the UI. Cool. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's it's a concept that is more important here, uh, which is um, that uh, you can work across a permission and a permissionless network in a seamless manner. So, you know, whether you have assets on a permission network, you can still make sure, you know, ensure that uh, the cash ledger or the public ledger can work with it. in a very secure manner, actually. I have a question. Sure. So the, um, so it's obviously some sort of, uh, I, I guess the term I would use is linkage uh, between these uh, two networks. Yep. Is it is it uh, one network or the other that provides the linkage and then the other one is uh, is just a uh, you know, standalone and can be used, or is there uh, neither of them and they're both standalone and there's software that does the linkage for them? How, how does the, uh, the communication? Yeah, so the yeah, I, yeah. So the the linkage is implemented through Weaver. Weaver is uh, again open source. Um, of open source software available through the Linux Foundation, I guess. Um, so Weaver is the one that we have used to implement. Um, there are some um, changes happening on the Weaver side. I think it is getting combined with um, Cacti. So that's that's the one which is the the relays and the smart contract is sitting on the um, Casper network. So both networks. Uh don't really know about the other network at this point there's a i i didn't hear what you said yes although, or i don't know how you spell it sweeper or something it sounded like weaver weaver can you spell that please uh, i'll put it in the chat here yeah that'd be great yep so it's just that tool that that does the uh you know manages the the uh, yeah the man yeah it manages the linkage and the smart contract and on cast for um, has has the 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 ability to lock in the tokens. Oh, okay. So there's some some uh, 
a, a feature on the Casper network that allows for this tool to be able to perform the linkage. Awesome. Yeah, the smart contract on Casper is also written in a way that um, it implements the the hash time lock contract. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. And Weaver is used for the, the relay between the two chains. Any any other questions? Yeah, so primarily this opens up uh, a tremendous uh, number of use cases because uh, currently uh, a lot of uh, a lot of organizations enterprises have hyperledger fabric as their core blockchain and assets are residing on those. Yeah, this must be really useful. I can see how there's so many use cases. Yeah. Plenty of use cases that, that will come up as a result of this. Mm -hmm. What were some of the biggest challenges in developing the interoperability between Casper and Fabric? Um, I think that just the concept of the hash time lock contract uh, and, and, and implementation of that was um, a bit novel. So that, that was one. And, um, and the piece of Weaver, which kind of relays the hash um, of, of secret between the two chains, that's an important piece as well. So, and, and of course, right, yeah, imagine the, the, the expertise in, in you need three, three different experts here. One is someone who knows Fabric really well, someone who knows Casper uh, smart contracts well, and someone who also understands Weaver. I think that was um, that was important. Right, right. Great. Well, thank you so much for this demo. Were there any other questions? All right. Well, really appreciate you joining the call, Ashok, and really interesting project. And I appreciate you walking us through it. I know it was low attendance today because of IAW, but I'm sure those who watch the recording will, will really benefit from this. So thank you all for yeah. joining and jumping in with uh, working group updates. And we'll see you all in two weeks. Yeah. And, and if there are any other questions, you can uh, certainly uh, email me and I can follow up. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ashok.